let's start with a quick quiz. I will give you five very common words in the English language. One of these is not borrowed. You try to figure out which one. So here are the five words. Law, peace, mile, sword, safe. So as I said, only one of those is a native English word, is not borrowed. Believe it or not, because they may sound all very English to you. It shows you just how embedded foreign borrowings are at this point in the language. Let me give you those five again. Law. Peace, as in war and peace. Mile, sword, safe. The answer is sword. In Old English, it is sweared. Law actually comes from Old Norse. Peace and safe come from French. And mile comes from Latin. For the past few lectures, we focused on some of the ways that English speakers change the language, working with the words they already have, including changing meanings, so how a word can change meaning over time, changing the pronunciation of words in the language, and making new words, taking prefixes, suffixes, creating new words. But of course, English has borrowed an enormous number of words from other languages. It's borrowed so many words, especially from Latin and French, that many people think that English is a Romance language. In fact, English is a Germanic language. What do I mean when I say that English is a Germanic language? It means that within the Indo-European family, you have family groupings within that. And Germanic is a different group from the Romance languages. So English is a West Germanic language, but it's borrowed a lot from Romance languages. You can see the Germanic nature of English in the language's bones, so to speak, in its grammar. The structural foundation of English is solidly Germanic, from the pronouns to the prepositions. For example, the ways that verbs make past tense is Germanic. They make it either with a vowel change, so sing, sang, sung, or with a final D, talk, talked. These kinds of fundamental grammatical features are Germanic. Some of the very core vocabulary is Germanic, and there are some notable exceptions, and we'll come back to those. But for those of you who know German, you'll recognize that, for example, mother and father North and South, very similar words show up in modern German. But you don't have to get too far outside the core of English to hit quite a lot of borrowed words. Over the next three lectures, we'll unpack the layers and layers of borrowing that have built up the English lexicon over the past millennium, century by century. So we'll be doing some historical work over these lectures, because while borrowing is not a huge factor today in terms of how English expands the lexicon, it has been a significant factor in the past. Now, some of these words are still recognizably borrowed. For example, foreign, formal words like phenomenon or investigate. But other borrowed words are so embedded that they feel as English as the native Germanic words that have come down in the language since Old English. For example, pale and monk come from Latin. Simple and common come from French. And sky and egg from Old Norse. In this lecture and the lectures to come, we'll be telling a story of language contact. We'll talk about the kinds of contact between English speakers and those of other languages that have allowed for these different kinds of borrowing. And we'll look at the repercussions of this language contact on the English vocabulary, because you're going to see different kinds of words in different parts of the lexicon and different words with different levels of formality. So we'll be thinking about questions such as, why are standardized tests filled with loan words from Latin, Greek, and French? And yet, there are Latin and French loan words, 
but not typically Greek, that are so mundane that it would never occur to us to put them on a test. In fact, the word test itself is a word borrowed from French, as is the word mundane. By looking at history, we can explain these patterns. These layers of borrowing in English, which are as old as English itself, should also make us skeptical of any nostalgic complaints about how the English language is no longer pure. If pure means free from contact with other languages, there has never been a moment in the history of English when the language was pure. And honestly, I doubt that any speakers who are lamenting about a recent change, who say that they don't want something to happen, they don't want English to borrow a particular word, that they would not actually want the language to be pure because they would lose so many words they love, including nostalgia and complaint. In this lecture, we'll go back to Old English, the language up until the 11th century, and we'll be looking at the earliest word hoard. And word hoard is a compound that shows up in Old English. It's in the poem Beowulf, and it's used to describe someone's store of words or their vocabulary. So in Beowulf, when they describe someone beginning to speak, they will say, and he unlocked the word hoard and spoke. As we look at the Old English word hoard, we'll see some very early borrowing into the language, some of which really pierced the core. But what we'll see most of is Germanic vocabulary, vocabulary that has come down from Indo-European through the Germanic languages into English. And it's one of the things that makes Old English in some ways sound so unfamiliar to us because it doesn't yet have all the borrowed words from French and Latin and other languages that are so familiar to us today. Let me pause here for a moment to talk about the word borrowing. I'm interested by this term in linguistics because if you think about the word borrow, it suggests that we might give the word back. But in fact, it's highly unlikely that the words we've borrowed are words that we're gonna give back. It suggests that there's something temporary in nature about this borrowing, but many of these borrowings are quite permanent. So we could think about a different word like stealing. English has stolen a lot of words in its history. But stealing, I think, doesn't work because it suggests that the original language no longer has the word that English has stolen, which of course is not true. So perhaps we could think about sharing, that English is sharing words with other languages. In some ways that's more accurate because now the word is showing up in both languages. But I have to say it makes me almost visualize a word cut in half where English gets part of the word and French gets part of the word. So I will continue to use the words borrowing and loanword, but I did want to problematize those in terms of their connotations. And I also want to make sure that we recognize that once the word is borrowed into English from another language, it is often Englishified, which is a word that I've kind of made up to describe a process where English speakers take a borrowed word and make it sound less borrowed, make it sound more English. So for example, the city name near where I live, Detroit, of course starts as Detroit, becomes Detroit, and for a good number of speakers in Michigan, the stress has now moved to the first syllable and it's Detroit. We see this uh, Englishification happening with a word like genre, borrowed in from French, that je sound at the beginning of a word, not a very English thing to do, and for some speakers, genre has become genre. We talked earlier about how contemplate became contemplate, again, making that word sound more English. In going back to Old English, we're going back to the beginning of the language. Now that raises a question of how do linguists decide when a language begins? English is often said to begin in 449 AD, or the fifth century. 
449 AD is selected because in the historical chronicles that we have written about that early history, 449 is identified as the date when the Germanic tribes, the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes, started to come in large groups from the continent to Britain. And when they came to Britain, they brought with them their Germanic dialects. So once those speakers bring the Germanic dialects to Britain, the, the dialects will start to change in ways different from the Germanic dialects on the continent. So certainly in 470, the Germanic speakers in Britain sounded a whole lot like the Germanic speakers on the continent. But over time, as all these dialects continue to change, the Germanic dialects in Britain, which become English, change in ways that are different from the ones on the continent, just due to geographic isolation. So that's why people take 449 as the beginning of English. Old English sounds very different from modern English. The vocabulary, as I said, is highly Germanic in nature, and the grammar is unfamiliar to us. So it can sometimes be hard to recognize that the words we're hearing are Old English. For example, Old English has grammatical gender. All nouns are gendered in Old English, masculine, and feminine, and neuter. And Old English has case. And if you know a language like Russian or Latin, you will recognize what case is. This is where nouns take different endings to signal their grammatical function. And this allows for much more flexible word order in Old English because the ending has already said, this is the subject, this is the object, the direct object, the indirect object. So it can appear in different places in the sentence. Just to quickly show you what I mean by that, let's take a very simple Old English sentence. Now, I've made this sentence up, and I seriously doubt that this was ever uttered in Old English, but here we go. Thought with Tham Kuninga Yef Thonahund. The woman to the king gave the dog, the hound. You'll hear some native words in there, some words you recognize. Weef, wife, Kuninga, king, hund, hound. But just to give you a sense of how the case is working there, we have Thought Weef is the subject, and she's giving the dog to the king. Tham Kuninga. If the king were the subject, it would actually look different. It would be Se Kuning. So that's how you will see different markers to show different function within the sentence. But you will see that there are words there that if we look at them closely, we can recognize that they're native English words. We'll find more native English words in the core of the language. The core of the language is, these are the words that we use most frequently. So these are the words that are going to be less susceptible to change, and the core is also less open to borrowing. So by the core, I mean these most common words, the ones we rely on the most. I also mean the function words, the words that hold up the structure of the language, pronouns, prepositions, articles. Of course, many of the structure or function words are also the most common words in the language. Let me show you what I mean. They've done studies using corpora, using these big electronic databases, to look at what the most common words in English are. So, in one study of spoken British English, the most common words are, and I'm just going to list these, the, and, I, to, of, a, you, that, in, it, is, yes, was, this, but, on, well, he, have, for. You'll notice that that's not a particularly interesting list of words. We've got a lot of function words in there, and almost all of those are native Germanic words. The same list, the looks, list looks very similar. When you do written English, you still get all those function words. If we look at the most common content words, in other words, verbs, nouns, adjectives, adverbs, 
In the top 50, the most common content words are also almost all native Germanic words. And here are some of the most common. Get, go, make, time, just, know, take, person, year, good, then, now, come, only, think, and work. Now you may have thought, I think those are all native, but there are actually four words in that list that are not native English words, that are borrowed. And those four are get and take, which both come in from Old Norse, and they're borrowed in the Old English period. And then just and person are borrowed from French, both borrowed right after the Norman conquest. So all of these words have been in the language for centuries. Another way to think about the core of a language's vocabulary is the Swadesh list. The Swadesh list is a list of vocabulary with very basic meanings, such as man, woman, son. And it was developed by the linguist Morris Swadesh in the middle of the 20th century. He developed it as a means for studying the relationship among languages. So for people trying to trace the historical relationship of languages, they need some way to compare and try to figure out which languages are closer and which languages might be more distant. distant. And the idea was that you could compare these most common terms, that this would be a place that languages would share them and you could look at how similar they were across languages. Now, the use of the Swadesh list has been controversial, as I think it should be. In some ways, it can be too mathematical. You need to know the sound changes to recognize the relationship among these vocabulary items across languages. And, of course, change is not constant. So the fact that these two words, these two languages have words that are closer to each other, it depends on how quickly the language changed in any period to know how closely related those languages are. But the Swadesh list does give us one useful way to think about basic words in a language. The version with 100 words contains words in some categories that are at the core of any language. So words for people, like man, woman, person, and pronouns like I, we, you. The category of animals, fish, bird, dog, louse, body parts, Blood, bone, skin, flesh, nose, eye, foot, tooth, heart, hand. Very common verbs. Eat, drink, bite, come, see, hear, know, die, sleep. And then natural phenomena like star, sun, moon, rain, sand, cloud, fire, and night. Now, If we look at these hundred words at the, on the Swadesh list, we see that for English, the vast majority are native English words with only a handful of borrowed terms. You'll notice that person appears again, this French borrowing that is first recorded in the OED in the 13th century. There are also a few Old Norse forms of common Germanic. These, so these are common Germanic, such as skin and egg. We'll return to the context situation that facilitated this kind of borrowing from Old Norse. So in talking about borrowing in English, it's important to start with the fact that English has been in contact with other languages before it even became English. English is a West Germanic language brought to Britain in the 5th century. Before the 5th century, speakers of this dialect came into contact with Latin speakers on the European continent. So this would have been a time of great trade during the Roman Empire, and we can see trade reflected in the words that these early Germanic dialects borrowed from Latin. Words like cheese, kettle, camp, wall, chalk, mile, pipe, street, wine, and peas. Let me pause here for an interesting etymological note about peas. The word peas which is borrowed in from Latin, was borrowed with the singular form peas and the plural form peasen. 
By late Middle English, the final n had dropped off the plural, which made the singular and the plural identical. Peas, and as you can imagine, this allowed speakers to reinterpret the final s of peas as plural, and so speakers created the singular form p through back formation. After all, if you have peas, only one of those would be a p. But back to history and language context. So when speakers of the Germanic dialects that would become English arrive in Britain in the fifth century, there are already loanwords in the language. In Britain, they encounter speakers of Celtic languages, who, it should be noted, had already been in contact with Latin as the Roman Empire had extended into the British Isles. The traditional storyline is that Celtic had almost no impact on English. Germanic speakers came to Britain. And they slaughtered the Celtic speakers, or they drove them to the margins of the island, north to Scotland or west into Wales. This was not a story of integration and close language contact. And it is true that there are not a lot of Celtic borrowings in the English lexicon. Some Celtic words can be found in place names. For example, comb means valley in a name like Widdicombe, and tor means rock. In a place name like Vixentor, the name of the River Thames comes from Celtic, as well as the name London for the city. Other Celtic words include lock for lake, glen for valley, and cross. The Old English word was rude, which is how we get the poem "The Dream of the Rude," which is told from the point of view of the cross on which Jesus was crucified. But more recent scholarship has challenged the idea that Celtic had so little influence on English, and there are fascinating proposals about the influence of Celtic on, for example, the rise of the progressive, for example, "I am running," and on the rise of "do" in negation and interrogatives. In Old English, you would not have had "do." You would have said something like "I know not," equivalent of that.、Uh, in the Renaissance, we see the rise of "do." I do not know. And people are now arguing that Celtic may help us explain where that "dummy do" came from. And I love the expression "dummy do." It's used to describe the fact that that "do" carries no meaning; it's just a grammatical form. But it's fair to say that the legacy of Celtic on the English vocabulary is limited. Now let's turn our attention to Old Norse. Old Norse actually had quite a significant impact on English vocabulary and grammar. But it's rarely in the spotlight the way that French is. Many people know about the Norman Conquest in 1066 and the fact that it had a striking impact on the English lexicon, and we'll turn to that in the next lecture. Many fewer people know about the Viking raids of the eighth and ninth centuries and the many legacies in English that come from Old Norse. So Old Norse is a North Germanic language. It comes in with the Viking raids in the eighth and ninth century. They start, as far as we can tell, about 787, and these the Vikings and Danes are coming from Denmark and Norway, and they attack the east coast of England. By the second half of the ninth century, they're launching very serious attacks on England, and in 878, King Alfred of Wessex in the southwest of England signs a treaty. The Treaty of Wedmore that establishes the Dane Law, which is a large area in the north of England where the Danes and Vikings were allowed to live peacefully. The boundary stretched from London to Chester along the Watling Road. From what we can tell, this led to peaceful settlement of a large number of Old Norse speakers in the Dane Law, where they farmed, they lived side by side with Old English speakers, and intermarried with Old English speakers. That kind of bilingualism in the area, where you have speakers who probably controlled both Old Norse and Old English, allowed for borrowing of Old Norse terms into the very center, the very core of English. Now, what do I mean by the core here? The best example of this is that the pronouns they, them, and their are borrowings from Old Norse. That is a highly unusual kind of borrowing to borrow a pronoun. Just imagine if we tried to borrow the French pronoun "nous" for "we" right now. That every time we we're supposed to say "we," we would say "nous." 
it would be hard to remember that. But if we were bilingual French-English speakers, we might import those French pronouns in while we were speaking English. And the same might have happened with Old Norse and Old English speakers in the Dane law. We see many other Old Norse borrowings that are very common everyday words, such as kid, get, both, anger, law, take, want, crawl, weak, and egg. The Old English word for egg was I or A. And there's a very amusing anecdote from the 15th century that only makes sense if you know that both the Old Norse form eggs and the native English form iron were still in circulation at the time. The anecdote appears in William Caxton's preface to what we would call the Aeneid. Caxton was the man who introduced the printing press to England, and he's talking about the difficulty of deciding which form to use in print to ensure that people will understand what you're printing. So if you have multiple forms in different dialects, which one do you choose? The story is about some merchants who are supposed to sail overseas, but they're stalled due to lack of wind, so they go to a house for food. So here's the story, and I'm going to modernize the pronunciation here. And one of them, named Sheffield, a mercer, came into a house and asked for meat, and specially he asked after eggs. And the good wife answered that she could speak no French, and the merchant was angry, for he also could speak no French, but would have had eggs, and she understood him not. And then, at last, another said that he would have iron. Then the good wife said that she understood him well. So there we see someone assuming that eggs is French, when, of course, it is Old Norse. It's coming in in the north of England and eventually spreads to the south, replacing iron. We see Old Norse borrowings elsewhere in the core of the language. Words like sky, these SK words, sky, skin, skill, skirt, the words skirt and shirt are related to each other. Shirt is the native English form, and skirt is borrowed from Old Norse. And once English had these two words for a long flowing garment, what happened is that one specified to refer to the top, the shirt, and the other specialized to refer to the bottom, the skirt. We've now talked about the influence of Celtic and Old Norse on English, once it got to Britain. In this period, English also came into contact with Latin again. This time, the contact came about through religion. We're going to see waves of Latin borrowing in the history of English. In 597, St. Augustine arrived in Kent, sent by Pope Gregory to convert the pagans in Britain. There had also been efforts um, for, con on, for conversion coming from Ireland. St. Augustine's efforts met with some success, and with Christianity came Latin terminology for religious items such as abbot, altar, angel, candle, deacon, disciple, hymn, martyr, mass, the words nun, pope, and priest, psalm, and shrine. The word God is a native English word, but the meaning changed pretty radically once it was adopted to refer to the Christian deity. With literacy, and the literacy came with religion to some extent, it was one of the practices, the monks were some of the scribes, um, that the training was happening in the church. And as a result, some of the basic English words for literacy and education also come from Latin. This is also when the Latin alphabet is imported. So we get Latin words including school and scribe. The word school nicely captures how entrenched many of these early borrowings are in the English language. And for most of us, they don't feel borrowed at all. It's important for us to remember that the history of English is the history of language contact and of linguistic borrowing or stealing or sharing, whatever you want to call that. There's never been a moment when English was not influenced by other languages. And the English vocabulary reflects that history, including at its very core. In fact, it's hard for us as English speakers to get through a sentence, let alone a paragraph, without a borrowed word, as I'll show you 
in the next lecture. In that lecture, we'll turn to the thousands of words that English borrowed after the Norman Conquest.